Throughout mathematics, zero to the zeroth power is a notoriously problematic expression. Is this expression defined to have a value of 1, or is it not defined at all, having no mathematical meaning? This video will explore some contexts where mathematicians have found it useful to define zero to the zeroth power as having a value of 1. That's not to say that this is a universal standard. There are still other places where the expression is undefined. The definition zero to the zeroth power equals one mainly occurs when thinking exclusively about natural number exponents, which are discrete as opposed to real or complex number exponents, which are continuous. Ultimately, many of the arguments over this subject can be resolved by taking into account the different needs of different areas of math. People will probably still argue anyway, but there's not much you can do about that. Empty product. What is the product of no numbers? It sounds like a bad riddle, but it's a genuine mathematical question and it's one that we often find ourselves needing to answer. As an example, we know that exponentiation is repeated multiplication. 2 cubed means multiply 3 copies of 2. So does 2 to the 0 with power mean multiply 0 copies of 2? Let's think about exponentiation in a different way. We can think of 2 cubed as meaning start with the number 1, then multiply by 2 3 times. So, 2 cubed equals 1 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is equal to 8. 2 cubed is 1 times 2 times 2, which is 4, and 2 to the power of 1 is simply 1 times 2, or just 2. With that information in mind, what is 2 to the zeroth power? We start with 1, and we don't multiply anything, so we end up with 1. Because of this, 2 to the zeroth power equals 1. Also notice, each time we decrease the exponent by 1, that's the same as dividing the whole thing by 2, since 2 is the base. For example, 8 divided by 2 is equal to 4, so 2 cubed divided by 2 is equal to 2 squared. Following this pattern, we similarly conclude that 2 to the zeroth power equals 1. The number 1 is called the empty product, the result of multiplying no numbers. 1 is also known as the multiplicative identity, because multiplying a number by 1 leaves it unchanged, that is, identical. So what if we use the same logic, but the base is 0 instead of 2? We can form a sequence similar to the one we saw before. As you can see, this ends with the conclusion that 0 to the 0th power equals 1. Technically, we weren't forced to make this specific pattern hold, but defining 0 to the 0th power to have a value of 1 is convenient in this instance. There are many other cases where this definition is useful, but this is the simplest one. Unfortunately, this doesn't follow the other pattern from before, stating that decreasing the exponent by 1 is the same as dividing by the base. Here, we'd have to divide by 0, and division by 0 is undefined. It has no meaning. For similar reasons, it turns out that a whole bunch of exponent properties break when the base is 0, so we simply exclude this case from those properties. Combinatorics Here's a simple combinatorics question. Imagine that you have an alphabet of just four letters. Let's say A, B, C, and D. If the order of the letters matters and you're allowed to use a letter several times, how many different three-letter sequences can you make with these letters? Well, for the first letter of the sequence, you have four choices. Then you have four choices again for the second letter. And if you multiply that by the four choices for the first letter, you get 16. Repeating this logic for the third letter, we multiply by 4 again, and 16 times 4 equals 64. So we have a total of 64 possible sequences of letters, which we got by multiplying together 3 copies of 4, that is, taking 4 to the third power. To use more mathematical terms, we can consider the alphabet from earlier to be a set, written with curly braces. A set doesn't have to contain letters, the elements of a set can be all kinds of objects. Meanwhile, the sequences we considered earlier are called tuples. A tuple is basically an ordered list of elements. A tuple is written with parentheses. The order of a tuple matters, so changing the order that we write the elements changes the tuple. Also, a tuple can contain one element multiple times, so inserting an element that's already in a tuple changes the tuple. As you may know, neither of these facts are true for sets, which don't care about order or repeating elements. Using these concepts, we can generalize the situation from before. If you have a set with m elements and you use those elements to form a tuple of length n, then the total number of ways to do that is m to the power of n. What we looked at is the special case where m equals 4 and n equals 3. So if we have a set with zero elements, that is, the empty set, 
Could we form, for example, a tuple of three elements that are each in this set? The answer is obviously no, since we don't even have any elements we could possibly choose from. So in this case, the number of tuples we can form is zero. Checking this using the formula from before, we get zero cubed, which is equal to zero as expected. In general, we can't form a tuple with a non-zero number of elements if you don't have any elements to use. Next, what if we try to form tuples that have zero elements? This is also pretty easy to figure out. There's only one tuple with zero elements and it's called the empty tuple. No matter how many elements we're allowed to choose from the starting set, it makes no difference, since we can't put any of them in the tuple. In terms of the formula, this tells us that any number to the power of zero is equal to one. One to the zero with power, two to the zero with power, three to the zero with power, and so on. In fact, this logic even holds for zero to the zero with power. The case where we have to form a tuple with zero elements from a set with zero elements. Earlier, when we had zero elements to choose from the empty set, we couldn't form a tuple that has a non-zero number of elements. However, forming a tuple that has zero elements is no problem. We just get the empty tuple like before. So the total number of tuples that we can form is equal to zero. In order for the formula to still work in this case, it's necessary to define zero to the zero with power as being equal to one. Like before, we aren't being forced to do this by the math gods, but the rules of math we use are just the ones that are the most useful in a given context. Set theory. In math, a function is a machine that takes in an object, the input, and gives you an object in return, the output. The same input always results in the same output. For example, imagine a function named f, which takes in some real number input x and gives you a real number output of x squared. If you put the number 3 into the function f, then the output will be 3 to the power of 2, which is 9. We can define the function f by writing the equality f of x equals x squared, where f of x denotes applying the function f to the input x. Now we can plug in any real number for x. For example, f of 3 equals 3 squared equals 9. The set of allowed inputs for a function is called its domain. For the function f that we defined, its domain is the set of real numbers. A function also has a codomain, which is a set containing all possible outputs of the function. Interestingly enough, the function's codomain doesn't always have to be the set containing only the possible outputs of the function. That set is called the function's image. For example, the way we defined f, its codomain is the set of all real numbers, even if f can never output a negative number. With all of this in mind, imagine a domain with three elements, say 1, 2, and 3. Then imagine a codomain with four elements, say a, b, c, and d. How many possible functions f are there that have this domain and codomain? To construct such a function for each input in the domain, we have to choose exactly one output in the codomain. Firstly, there are four choices for what f of 1 can be. It's either a, b, c, or d. The same is true of f of 2. Note that there's no rule forcing us to choose different outputs for each input. So, for example, we could let both f of 1 and f of 2 be equal to a at the same time. When we multiply the four options for f of 1 by the four options for f of 2, we end up with 16 options. Then there are once again four options for f of 3 and 16 times 4 equals 64. So there are a total of 64 ways that we can define the function f which is equal to 4 cubed. We can use this to state a general rule. For a domain with n elements and a codomain with m elements, the total number of possible functions from the domain to the codomain is m to the power of n. At this point, you may notice some similarities with the combinatronic setup. Indeed, it turns out that the two setups are sort of like different ways to say the same thing. If that's not apparent yet, we'll keep going, and you can see if you notice any more parallels. What if the domain of f has three elements and the codomain has zero elements? In that case, we run into problems trying to choose outputs for each input to map to. Because there isn't anything in the codomain to choose. So coming up with any definition for f is impossible. Meaning that there are zero possible definitions for f. This corresponds to saying that zero cubed equals zero. In general, you can't define a function from a non-empty domain to an empty codomain. Next, what if the domain of f has zero elements and the codomain has four elements? Can we map every element of the domain to an element of the codomain? 
Well, we're already done. There aren't any inputs that we haven't chosen an output for, so we don't need to do anything for our function to be fully defined. This is sort of strange, but it's a valid concept in mathematical logic, known as vacuous truth. This gives us one possible function in this case. Arithmetically, this is the same as saying that 4 to the 0 with power equals 1. A function whose domain is empty is called an empty function. Mathematicians require the existence of empty functions in order to ensure that our system of set theory makes sense. For every set, there is exactly one empty function whose codomain is that set. We looked at just one example of an empty function earlier, but we really could have chosen anything as the codomain. We can even choose the codomain to be the empty set. When we do, we have a function whose domain and codomain are both empty. Each one has zero elements. Knowing this, let's apply the formula from earlier. In this case, the number of possible functions should be equal to zero to the zero with power. We already know that the empty function is the one possible function. So if we want the formula to still apply, it's useful to define zero to the zero with power as being equal to one.